I encourage you at this time to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, where we have our scripture reading. This morning, Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 5 says, And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then starting the reading in 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. They went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others, who would enslave them and afflict them for 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come and, out and come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham became the father of Isaac, and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him, and rescued him out of all his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit and on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor and Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt. Until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was mighty in his words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now when forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in a flame, a fire, and a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. 
And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol, and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices? During the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel, you took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Raphon, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dis dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, said the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. <sighs> All right. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. What I just read to you there is the longest recorded sermon in the book of Acts. Now, what's interesting about the longest recorded sermon in the book of Acts is that it's not from an apostle. It's not from Peter. At this point, you could think that, in some ways, the book of Acts is all about the Acts of the Apostles and how God's Spirit works through apostles and how the work of Christ is continuing through the apostles. But here... In Acts chapter 6, we learn something else. We learn something that can be applied to all of us, not those just called to be apostles and pastors and elders in the church. And that is that spirit-filled testimony confronts unbelief in love. Spirit-filled testimony is for all Christians who are born again, born again and filled with the Holy Spirit and Example number one of that is Stephen. We are told about Stephen last week as we looked at Acts chapter 6. Stephen was one of the seven that was chosen to wait tables. Somebody who was just an ordinary person of character, yes. Somebody who was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit as Acts chapter 6 verse uh, 5 says. And faith but we learned that God was using this ordinary man who had been uh, brought up to be somebody who would have spirit-filled testimony. We learn at the beginning of this chapter that Stephen's character is one of full of grace and power. Um, and we learned that the Spirit of God is at work not just in the apostles, but even in Stephen and the others. There are Stephen's doing great wonders and signs among the people. And we learned that Stephen is going out and he is confronting uh, those who are Jews of the uh, Hellenist Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews. He's going in among them and he is arguing with them. He is using apologetics and reason and talking to them about, well, we don't know the exact content of Stephen's message, but we can gather that what he's doing is proving to them that Jesus is the promised Messiah of the Jewish people and that the true Jew would be the one 
who believes in Jesus and worships Jesus and follows the way. Follows the way of the Christian. And so this is Stephen's character, and he's, he's just a servant in the church. And this is important, and this is an important distinction being made in the book of Acts, because as I said, it's very easy to um, read the book of Acts and to begin to say to ourselves, I'm not a part of this story. This is about specially anointed believers like the apostles, like Peter, James, and John, and, and the apostle Paul. Whew. Talk about a guy. This isn't really about me. I'm not in this story. I'm not part of Acts chapter 22. But what we read about here in Acts chapter 6 in Stephen's spiritual testimony before the council in the Sanhedrin is that God has empowered all of us with his spirit. And we have each unique gifts and capabilities. We have each unique places in our life and people and spheres of influence that God has given us. But Stephen is just an ordinary man. He is a servant in the church who is, by the power of God within him, the Holy Spirit, boldly proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ, the promised Jewish Messiah, has come and there is salvation in him. But we find out that this spirit-filled testimony, this spirit-filled conviction, this spirit-filled proclamation draws attention to Stephen, just like it has drawn attention to Peter and John earlier in our study. And so you can almost see echoes of what happened to Jesus, right? Jesus is preaching his message. Jesus is communicating the truth of the kingdom of heaven. And they can't find anything to stick on him. There is no skeletons in his closet. There's no... Uh, things that they can find to, uh, to arrest him and to punish him. And so what do they have to do? They have to come up with something. And so verse 12, we're told, and verse 11, we're told, they secretly instigated men who said, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and they seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Now Stephen is, you can get a, a grasp of what Stephen is talking about here in this. Stephen is talking about how the coming of Jesus is not a doing away of the Jewish ways, but rather a fulfillment of them. And those who are living this Jewish way, these, these uh, hardcore Jews in, the, in, the, in Jerusalem, the, the leaders in the temple and those who are practicing the Jewish faith, they don't like that what Stephen is communicating seems to be a communication of the end of their way of life, the end of their practices. But what they don't understand is that what Stephen is communicating is the furthering of them the extension of them, the development of them, the future of the true Jew. And so they arrest him. They arrest him. And at this point, if you're reading straight through the book of Acts, you might find it very interesting to realize that just not too long ago, these very same council and had arrested Peter and John and the other apostles and thrown them in prison and, and brought them before everybody and, and had said, hey, what are you doing? And Peter had given them a, another message saying, you need to repent and turn to Jesus. And so, uh, but they released them and nothing happened. And so maybe this is just a repeat of that, right? Maybe, maybe there's not a real sense of danger in Stephen's arrest. But what we'll come to find out as we look at it next week is that there is, there is a real sense of danger in confronting unbelief, even if you do it in love, even if it's tough love. 
And verse 15 tells us something very interesting about Stephen's appearance. Is that as they gathered the council and they had Stephen there and he was being told of all these crimes he has committed, they said, gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now, I'm not really sure what that means, but I can tell you it doesn't mean that he was stressed out, that he was on edge. It means that, in a very real sense, that he was tranquil, peaceful, anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that this was his moment, that God had called him to. He wasn't thinking, oh no, I'm not an apostle. I shouldn't be here. He wasn't thinking, oh no, uh, uh, how am I going to withstand this? I'm not an especially holy anointed 12, number of the 12. I'm just one of the seven. I'm just a servant in the church. I'm just somebody who waits tables. He had the face of an angel. God, we're told often, does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. He will give you what you need when you are in need of it. Oftentimes we don't take that step because we think that we're not ready for it. But the way of faith is this, that often when we make that step, when we take that step of faith, it is then that God gives us what we are in need of. It is then that God gives us what we need of the Spirit, of His Spirit, of His conviction, of His strength, of His courage. Because faith and courage, courage is not lack of fear. Courage is not empty of fear. Courage is having fear, but still choosing to do the right thing. And Stephen's face is like that of an angel. Here's his moment. And he gives this sermon. The speech, the longest recorded sermon in the book of Acts. In fact, it's one of the best places to go if you need a quick review. I like to call it the cliff notes of the history of Israel. That's what, that's what Stephen's sermon is. It's the cliff notes on the history of God's people and redemption. Why is it that Stephen goes through all this trouble to reenact and to retell for the, the, these religious leaders the history of their own people? Don't, don't you think they know that? Every kid that goes to rabbi school learns this, Stephen. Why are you telling them all these things about the history of Israel and the history of God's working in His people and God's redemption in His people? Well, if there is one way that I could summarize Stephen's sermon, it would be this. That there are many ways that God worked redemption through His people. And Stephen... He hits the high points, right? The highlights. There's Abraham called out of the land of the Chaldeans to be the father of the Hebrew nation. There's Joseph sold by his brothers into slavery, yet used by God to save the people of Israel and many others. There's Moses called to be the leader and the redeemer of God's people by taking them out of slavery in Egypt and bringing to them bringing them to a place where they can worship and praise God. There's Joshua who took over for Moses. There's David. And what is it about all these characters that Stephen mentions? He mentions that there was so much weight put upon these individuals in the history of Israel. Stephen here is standing before these people because they said, this guy spoke against Abraham and Moses and, and those who have called our way of life. These are great fathers of the faith that we look up to. And, and, and Stephen wants them to understand, Abraham can't be your savior. Joseph can't be your savior. Moses can't be your savior. David can't be your savior. They were all here. They lived. God did great things through them. They're dead. They're buried. 
they're in the ground. And even during their ministry, the people of Israel spurned them. The people of Israel did not listen to them. The people of Israel chased after other gods. The people of Israel took the prophets and got rid of them when they spoke the truth of God and talked about the one who was to come, the righteous one who was going to be sent by God, the prophet who was like Moses, one of their own people who would come after him. They spoke of all these things, and what did you guys do? You said, mm -mm, we don't want to hear it. And Stephen, in love for his own people, very much so like Paul, like Paul who said, I'd rather be accursed and cut off from God that my own people, my own flesh, the people of Israel would come to know Jesus as their Savior. Stephen here in love, even though it seems such harsh language and, and, and such cutting uh, testimony, he confronts their unbelief. He says, you stiff-necked people. Now, it's not an accident that Stephen says stiff-necked people. This is the exact same word spoken of about the people of Israel as they were in the wilderness wanderings, who said, we want to go back to Egypt. We're tired of this stuff. We, we want to go back where we were slaves. This is the same thing that was said about the people of Israel when Moses was up on the mountain and he was up there a while and he, Aaron, will you make for us a God so that we can follow after it? And they turned away from God. This is the same thing that was said about the people of Israel when they were in the promised land and they kept turning away to worship other gods and idols. This is the same thing said about the people of Israel when finally they made it into the promised land and 12 spies went in and all 10 of them except for uh, Joshua and Caleb said, we can't go in there. We can't do this. There's no way we can win this land. And so they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the same word said about the people of Israel. Confronting their unbelief. You stiff-necked people uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Stephen's saying, you're doing just what these other people did. When they're telling you, when we are telling you that the Messiah has come and that we need to repent and turn back to God by believing in Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, you're saying, no, 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 I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want anything to do with that. The righteous one has come. And you, because of your hardness of heart, your stiff-neckedness, your uncircumcised in heart and ears, you betrayed and murdered the righteous one, the coming Messiah. You who received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep them. Stephen's saying, Abraham can't be your Savior. Moses can't be your Savior. Joseph can't be your Savior. David can't be your Savior. The temple can't be your Savior. God doesn't really live there. The prophets can't be your Savior. You didn't listen to them. You killed them. The only one who can be your Savior is the promised righteous one that has come. Take away your sin and to give you a new heart, a circumcised heart. To give you ears that you can hear, eyes that you can see. The goodness of God and the final bringing of redemption in the people of Israel. This is the culmination of what all our history of redemption is leading towards. Don't you see that, guys? Don't you see this is what it's all about? And you're, you're over there, you're saying, I don't believe it, I'm not going to believe it, I'm not going to bend my knee, I'm not going to listen to what you have to say, I'm going to persecute you just like we, my forefathers persecuted the prophets who came before. I'm going to say, no, 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 I don't want anything to do with that. And it's going to cost Stephen his life.
Yet nonetheless, spirit-filled testimony confronts unbelief in love. It confronts unbelief in love. Now, are we going to have the same presentation and the same message to somebody who's not a Jew, who wasn't raised knowing the God of the Old Testament and the history of the redemption and uh, the way God has worked through the people of Israel? No. But can we confront unbelief lovingly in our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, calling them once again to believe in the Jesus who has uh, said, who has never let them down? We can. Can we confront unbelief in people who have not turned to find Jesus as their Savior? Can we, can we talk to them about the fact that they know that they are not perfect, that they know that they are sinners, that they, that they know that they, um, uh, that, that they need to know that it, you can't be good enough to get into heaven, that there has to be somebody who is good enough for you, and that, and that is Jesus. Can we confront unbelief in people like that, in a loving way. Yes, we can. And Stephen here shows us that all we need to do is not, to be, a, not be a historian of Israel, not be somebody who knows all the Bible verses and all the things by memory and who can uh, do the Roman robe because you know it like the back of your hand or anything like that. No, what Stephen here is showing us is what the one desire that we need is care, concern, and genuine love for the other person. And a willingness to be used by God, by our spirit that's within us, the Holy Spirit that's been given to each and every one of us, to work through our weakness, to share the good news of Jesus Christ to all that God gives us opportunity to do so. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. Thank you for spirit-filled testimony. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to confront unbelief and love, whether we see it in our own hearts when we look in the mirror, whether we see it in brothers and sisters we're seeking to encourage, or whether we see it in the world and in and among those we love who are without hope and lost in this world, without a God and without a Savior. May you give us genuine care and love for them, and may you empower us by your Holy Spirit to confront unbelief and love and call people to faith in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray.